This video is about my new basement watchdog pump, which um, I re used to replace an older one that was still working fine, but I wanted additional capacity. Here's the original basement watchdog with its standpipe and a length of flex pipe, a check valve, and so on. And here's the old controller, which uh, was working, except that uh, the beeper had stopped functioning, so it wasn't warning me when there were battery issues and so on. And uh, uh, Glentronics, who makes basement watchdogs, said they would fix it, you know, happily fix it, but I decided it was time to get a, a, a newer one. This had been in there for quite a while. And then came the big flood of uh, July 2017 in northern Illinois and uh, I had five different pumps going in my basement to keep up with the influx of water and then when the power went out then uh, this was the only thing pumping and I came to realize how short a period that it would run if it was running full out not just intermittently you know it couldn't make more than a couple hours and it was gonna have water coming in for a lot longer than that I wanted something that would run for considerably longer and probably have a bit more capacity if it was the only pump running. So this is the crappy corner of my basement that has the the sump in it. Uh, this is quite an old house and things aren't done really the way you would do them now but it does work. So there's the drain tile coming in. There's another one coming from the left. It's kind of out of sight. and. Uh, I've got a pedestal pump in here right now. This one burned out during the big flood and I was desperate to get whatever I could get my hands on and this was all that was left. The old one was a pedestal pump too, but uh, I came to realize that the motor burned out because it was running full out and the thermal protection didn't work for some reason. So it failed and uh, the pump itself was okay, just the motor burned out. You may notice I've got this piece of PVC pipe here um, which sits on a couple of uh, nylon or Delrin pillow blocks which are stuck with a tap con into the floor and then there's a uh, sort of a cotter pin and then a U-bolt goes around there. I had a number of cases where the pedestal pump walked sideways a little bit over time and the float doesn't have a lot of clearance down there and it would touch the side of the, the, um, the pit and drag and then it wouldn't turn on and I had some flooding a couple times due to that or the whole pedestal would tip over for some reason so um, <clears throat> I put this in here and that helped a lot I would recommend anybody with a pedestal pump do that because they are top heavy and there's really not that much keeping them from tipping over or walking around in there anyway um, the new basement watchdog pump is down there and it's just like the old one. I can hardly tell the difference. I've got a standpipe coming up or a riser pipe. You can kind of see down there where the black dot is. I circled the um, hole. You're supposed to drill on the side of there. It's a downward facing eighth inch hole uh, safely above the water line as they recommend. And uh, that's to prevent an airlock uh, that would uh, prevent it from starting properly. The new basement watchdog floats are these double double floats so they've actually got two reed switches in there operated by magnets in the floats so if one doesn't work the other one will a couple inches higher. Uh, I've got this other basement watchdog switch it's the old kind with one float and that's wired into my uh, emergency house uh, system that monitors the water level down here. And then on top of that I've got these, um, not sure if it's too clear where it is, but right there. It's like an antenna wire. Uh, twin lead going up here and this is from a, um, I think it's Reliance. It's um, a home monitoring system that measures or monitors things like power and temperature if you're going to freeze and burst your pipes. Water level can be sensed at various locations and it calls you on the phone. 
So I've got that system set at the highest set point. I've got the alarm set at a point higher than the uh, basement watchdog switch, and that itself is set higher than the float on the main uh, pump. So the main pump turns on. If it can't keep up or if it fails, then the water level rises and trips hopefully the lower of the two uh, switches on the basement watchdog system. If the water rises above that and hits the blue reed switch, then my alarm system goes off. And if it goes almost to the top of the pit, then this other sensor picks it up and calls me on the phone wherever I am and say, hey, you've got a problem. So uh, I have a dual discharge. You can see another video I've got on how I modified my outdoor discharge, but this is the discharge for um, I mixed up. Now this is the discharge for that system behind this grubby piece of plastic. Um, the line goes into a crawl space and then makes a turn and goes out underground, but also uh, has a Y in it and goes out above ground where I can tap in a uh, a fixed angled pipe that drains down to the driveway so if it can't pump out underground ground because it's plugged or frozen or whatever then uh, it'll get out the other way. Um, I also have a, a big uh, valve down there just above the sump pit where I can drain that line out while the pump is running. Um, it catches some sludge and stuff that collects down there and I drain it out every once in a while plus it's just a good way to test it if I'm not really sure it's running or how much it's pumping, I can crack that open and it splashes out and runs back into the pit and I can see that it is indeed kicking water out. Um, on my secondary line, this one I put in much more recently and it actually has a sort of a clean out or observation plug in it and that goes out through the crawl and goes out into the terracing down into a swale area and that's uh, all within the confines of the house so it wouldn't freeze unless everything goes to heck. <laughs> uh, and then this also has a drain test clean out whatever and then the sump line comes in. This is the one for the basement watchdog. And uh, I did something a little differently here. When I replaced both these pumps I went from the inch and a quarter flex line that I had to an inch and a half. They're really set up for inch and a half and I was messing around with lots of adapters to get it to work with inch and a quarter, so I abandoned that and uh, went with the inch and a half. Unfortunately, the, the hose that I could find is all six feet long uh, between uh, flat sections where you're supposed to couple it. So to keep it from snaking around and touching the float or getting in the way and causing problems, I've got it clamped at the side of a workbench here. It just keeps it up out of the way. And then this one here from the basement watchdog starts right here. And uh, there's the check valve down there, right where I'm pointing. And then it goes up into the flex hose and makes a loop and then comes in down there. Uh, I've got it all wire tied to various things so it hopefully uh, won't thrash around a lot and cause trouble. If I find that it does, I'm going to re-rig it in some different way. Um, let's see what else I can say about that. Well, this other pipe coming in there is the air conditioner condenser, so that constantly drips during the summer. Uh, let's see. You might be interested in this little system I've got here. This is a homebrew um, system. It's got... Uh, battery holder with four D batteries or D cells on the back and four D's on the front and uh, just got a little bit of digital logic and there might be an op amp or something there's a optocoupler LED optocoupler um, and uh, basically what it does is this monitors AC power in the house um, it just plugs directly into the line and uh, if the AC power stays out for a timed, uh, timed period, then um, it'll give an alarm. Or if the float switch in the sump pit is activated for a few seconds, then it'll also give the alarm. And once it gives the alarm for either purpose, 
it locks it in and it doesn't matter whether the AC power goes away it's got the battery backup and uh, it has a couple of LEDs down here that flash to get your attention they're bicolor and they go red when there's a problem green is good uh, there's a test and a reset switch and then there's just a regular phone cable here that runs up to a couple locations in the house and in parallel I have modified switch plates uh, just in the wall as if it was a light switch or something modified switch plates and it has a uh, sun alert in there which is ear splittingly loud you can't miss it when it goes off and uh, that's powered from this and then there's also a pair of uh, test and reset buttons just like these on those panels so from either those locations or here you can trigger it to test it out or you can reset the alarm but if the alarm is still valid it just comes right back on that saved my bun so many times uh, I'll come home from a trip you know I won't even realize it rained while I was gone and it'll tell me that there was a, a high water issue even if it didn't crest the sump pump or the sump pit I'll know that it reached that magnet or that there was a power outage and I should go around and check various things in the house that are affected by power outages and uh, it woke me this is the thing that woke me up on the night when the huge thunderstorms came through otherwise I would have been blissfully unaware that I had a big problem and I had to take quick action to keep uh, from a big disaster happening in my house uh, if I hadn't had this the other systems I had I probably wouldn't have heard uh, so this is a pretty cool thing that you know I don't know if there's anything commercial like this but it's pretty easy to whip it up on your own um, I can force it to test here by holding this in for a few seconds you can hear the beeping that's coming from a sensor on the other side of the house so even down here in the basement and all that distance and through the different rooms and doorways I can hear it and you can see the red LED flashing here and then I reset it so I lied before this is just a AC power indicator and this is the uh, the alarm indicator so this is one of my two remote panels for the uh, system I just described um, it's the size of a normal uh, plate for a switch or an outlet but uh, since I have access to a uh, engraving machine I just engraved a piece of uh, plastic with a black core like you'd use for making industrial name plates but I could have just as easily used a regular switch plate and used some sort of uh, label or something and I wouldn't even have needed to do that it's pretty self-explanatory uh, and then just mounted it to uh, a box this doesn't even have a box behind it because it's all low voltage wiring and I actually tuck the wire behind the uh, frame of a uh, or a door frame and this is just in the room of my entryway of my house so this one I get you know if I'm just walking through the door coming back from being out of town or something I can tell if there's a problem um, and then the other ones at the other end of the house anyway so it's got a sun alert here which is quite loud and uh, then there's the uh, test button and the reset button so I'll fire it off from here so that's the way that works anyway so I have that I also have a small battery of various test bits and plug uh, ports for hooking up to these pipes here doing various tests I just keep everything right here I've got my handy dandy uh, Grace Digital um, internet radio that I use whenever I'm down here in the basement just for yucks I'll turn that on now I was listening for to old time radio comes on from here the last. Fox River lock system dedicated to preserving the history of the locks and opening the Fox River for recreation um, anyway so the basement watchdog I used to have just a duplex outlet up here and everything was plugged in with an outlet strip and it was a rat's nest and it was a mess so as part of this uh, basement watchdog upgrade I replaced it with a, uh, a duplex box and a uh, single box uh, they're all on the same circuit but I've got a 
surge protector on there because of the solid state nature of this basement watchdog and their strong recommendation that you do it. So I uh, plug that in there. Both the primary and the basement watchdog pumps are plugged in there. And then I've got this here. Instead of the outlet strip, I can plug in my alarm system and my uh, wall work for the uh, internet radio. And up here, just while we're talking, I've got this ancient inverter. Not a very powerful one, but I've used that a number of times when I needed power down here during a power outage and I didn't want to go hook up my big generator outside, I would just clip this onto the uh, battery terminals of the basement watchdog and then get a little AC off of there for plugging in my LED work lights or a drill or you know whatever I needed. It has enough uh, capacity for that. I just keep it right up there. Anyway, so here's the new basement watchdog. I got the so-called Big Dog Plus. It's the newest model and uh, I built a little shelf here right on the wall that holds it. They recommend it's four feet off the ground or thereabouts. And I just put it at what seemed like a good height to me. This is around the back. It's got a little fan which I think runs all the time, or at least when it's charging heavily. Uh, this is the line here where the uh, float switch goes in. This is the plug where the pump plugs in. This is the main AC fuse, this is the power cord, there's the battery cable coming out there. This is the fuse for the battery, I believe. It's the DC circuit fuse anyway. And here's a USB port. Uh, this Plus model has a set of relay contacts here which you can wire up to a home security system and uh, have it trigger it. They have several different products that will use a data link and this is one of them. The regular Big Dog, I believe, does not have it. The Big Dog Plus does have it. It's a thing that cost about $200 and it plugs into this and the other models that accept it. And it is a Wi-Fi unit. It will go through your Wi-Fi router and uh, give you various status indications um, over Wi-Fi. Uh, I made this shelf uh, a foot deep and a foot wide. That seems to be a good size for it. That gives some of these cables are pretty thick and stiff and I wanted to not bend them really close to the case. And it also gives enough room back there for the fan to work properly. So let's look over the control panel here. Uh, it's got this one blue button. This is really like a membrane panel uh, stuck on a sheet of aluminum. There's an actual switch. It's not a membrane switch. There's an actual push-button switch on the circuit board, which is right behind here. And uh, when you push this membrane, it's actually pushing that physical switch on the circuit board. Um, the older models apparently had two push buttons. I'm not sure. It's a blue push button here. It says push to test or reset. And then you can pick what type of battery you've got. Uh, the, and then uh, it's got some general status LEDs and a battery power level, sort of a four-point bar graph. Uh, these are brand new batteries I've got, and they're reading 100% right now. If the battery is low, uh, has a low fluid level, you get this. Uh, if there's a battery problem that can be fixed by checking cables and so on, you'll get this. If the AC power has failed or the fuse blew or something, you'll get this one. Uh, if there's a pump issue or maybe the DC fuse blew, you'll get this. And if the pump was activated, you'll get this so you'll know that your primary pump didn't work for some reason. So that's about it, just really five points and they're pretty comparable to what was on my older pump control panel, but it didn't have this power status. I'm not really sure how useful that'll be. Um, there are a few things about Glentronics. I mean, it's an American company, you know, made in the USA and all that good stuff, and they have pretty good tech support, which is why I've stuck with them. But there's also some rather embarrassing things, like this is a new product, Big Dog Plus. Uh, pump was activated. Push white button for one second to reset alarm. Well, guess what? It's a blue button. It doesn't say much about their whoever is checking their quality control or reviewing their documentation 
that they didn't catch something blatant like that. And there's actually a lot of things like that when you start looking at it with any, you know, detailed view. The they have. Uh, videos on YouTube that don't agree with what it says in the manual, that don't agree with other sources of information. Uh, so, you know, I think it's always kind of bad when a company can't get their act together and have consistent documentation, um, especially when they have a per fairly small number of products. It's not like they're chasing a thousand products or anything. Anyway, uh, I can push for one second to test and the pump is running down there, you can hear it. And if it had come on normally, I would have got a light here. Uh, and then I would have had to reset it using that button. But it didn't sound the alarm here because I just tested it. Uh, so there's that. Now I can talk about the, the batteries. Uh, they have these battery boxes that one of them comes with the the pump kit and the other one I had to buy separately I wanted it to match just for aesthetic reasons so I ordered it from Glentronic so I get the same kind um, I actually bought the pump kit with the what you get is the power unit here you get the pump and you get one battery case but no battery or batteries and you don't get the PVC, you don't get the check valve, you don't get any of the other hardware. So really, a battery box, a control unit, and a pump is what you get with the kit. Uh, you have to buy your battery elsewhere. I bought the, the main thing from Home Depot online because they didn't seem to have the, the plus version in the store. And I found that if I ordered it online and had it brought in, they actually drop shipped it from Glentronics instead of shipping it from a... Uh, Home Depot warehouse somewhere and that was the only way through them that I could get the latest version or be sure of getting it. Uh, this, the guys in the store weren't at all interested in you know ordering me one when they had some of the older ones still in stock. Um, anyway so here's the battery box you can snap it down or you can just leave it laying on there to keep the dust off and the spiders out. Um, the batteries, this is the actual official basement watchdog battery. It's a marine type battery. It comes with the carrying handles, which is nice. Um, I don't think there's anything special about it. I haven't done any reviewing on it. You know, it's the battery they endorse, it's the one they warranty, and I imagine it's a pretty good battery. It's probably not the best one I could have gotten if I really did some homework and so on. Anyway, it has the usual basement watchdog thing where the second fill cap from the plus side is the one you put the special yellow cap in, and then this electrode plugs in and monitors uh, battery fluid level. Um, I always keep the original cap there in case I decide to dispose of the battery. I've got something to screw into that position. Uh, you'll notice here I've got two cables or two wires coming off of each side and by the way they use wing nuts so there's no special tools required. This is this uh, yellow cable which is another thing I had to order from Glentronics. They didn't have any of the stores that I found uh, that carried this product. None of them had the battery boxes or this yellow cable. It's nothing special. You could buy a cable from the hardware store but it's not too expensive and I decided to get the official one. And that goes to the second battery. Same model of battery, same battery box. It just has both batteries in parallel, and that approximately doubles the the uh, run time that this uh, pump will go on battery power. Um, let's see. I'm not I'm not really crazy about these battery boxes. They give you the. Uh, oops, I had the thing on backwards. They have these uh, wider sections there to accommodate the cables. There we go. So, uh, the Big Dog product is, I believe, the only basement watchdog product that will accommodate a dual battery. And that's the main reason why I got it, plus the fact that it's also their only product that has a high-powered um, AC power supply in it. All the other ones have little wall wart type. Matter of fact, here's the 
AC power supply for my old basement watchdog products, just a little trickle charger. Um, if you have depleted your battery in an event like a big flood or something, heavy series of thunderstorms, you're stuck. That pump isn't going to run anymore because the little trickle charger can't supply enough power to run the pump and the battery's dead and it's going to take hours before it gets charged enough to run the pump again. So it's really only good for short-term intermittent use. This one, however, and this is the other main reason I got it over the other ones, is that uh, it's got a big honking power supply inside of there. That's why the box is so big. And it can supply power to the pump uh, continuously from uh, AC power as long as the AC power is on. So in that case it does not deplete the battery and only runs off the battery when it needs to. Um, some of my friends told me I was nuts buying two rather expensive batteries for this thing. You know, you'll never use it. Uh, the batteries will just go bad after a few years and etc. etc. Well, um, I was thinking, I was sitting here in a flood and I had exactly the kind of problem that this model would have prevented if I'd had it. And I was saying to myself, boy, I wish I had that, that big dog type that can run off the AC power and has a much bigger battery capacity because that's what I really needed at that point. And uh, this one has it. Um, there are competing products that I've seen that are similar. Um, probably do a similar job. I think the pumps are fairly comparable. They do have a uh, similar case. Um, my uh, Some of my relatives, actually two of my relatives, have a competing product. I don't even know who makes it. It doesn't have all the LEDs and so on on it. It just has a, a blank panel with a push button and I think one or two LEDs. You know, it probably works just fine. Maybe this other stuff is unnecessary and just for show. Um, I don't think so, but you know, you could make the argument. On the other hand, those cost them more than this costs me. So now I get down to the cost issue. What do these things actually cost? The basic big dog product with, again, just the power supply control unit here, one battery box, which can't, you know, isn't worth more than ten dollars or something, and the pump itself, and some, some cable, uh, that's five hundred dollars street price. That's what they sold it for, or sold it to me for from Home Depot. And uh, then to make it useful, you need at least one battery, which is I think they're about one hundred twenty dollars, and preferably, well, the battery box comes with it for the first battery, so there's that. But then you're going to need, you know, unless you already have a sump, a, a, a standby sump pump, you're going to need to have you know, probably another 40 bucks or so at least for a check valve and hose, PVC pipe, zip ties, you know, whatever. I've got a lot more junk on here than the basic system, so um, this probably costs me more than it would cost somebody else in a more normal setup. Uh, but in my case here, I'm talking about... Uh, Oh, you have to get the battery acid too, because these batteries come totally empty, just the lead plates in there, and you need to add the battery acid. That's better part of another 20 bucks for a, a, a box uh, or a bottle of acid, sulfuric acid. And uh, so let's say it's $150 per battery, so I've got $300 in these two batteries, plus $500 for this and the pump, so I'm up to 800 and then, um, you know, the battery box and the other cable, say that's another 50 bucks, so up to 850. Um, I don't think I paid for shipping on this because Home Depot shipped it to me for free. I picked up the batteries at the store, that obviously didn't cost me any shipping. Um, I think the, the black flex hose and the PVC pipe and the check valve and some unions and couplings and stuff probably cost me another hundred dollars, so up to about nine hundred fifty dollars. So you're pretty close to a thousand dollar system here. Um, I know that the ones my relatives got installed cost them about two thousand dollars. I'm sure a lot of that's just the labor. Um, this took me the better part of a day to do everything here. 
uh, that was including tearing out the old one, doing all the, the plumbing stuff, going shopping to the hardware store for the parts I needed, filling the batteries, reading the manual, mounting the shelf to the wall, redoing the outlets, you know, all that stuff was a, a one-day project. Uh, but now it's done and it seems to be working, and uh, I'm going to follow this uh, talking part of the video with a slideshow of uh, some pictures I took of the inside of the control unit and some other views that aren't so clear on the video. Hope you found this useful. Oh yeah, one other thing. Um, the manuals and the online tutorials are full of admonitions to uh, make sure you buy the right kind of battery and they say use only the seven and a half hour battery um, and that's what they call it go to the store go online can't find a seven and a half hour battery nothing by that name whatsoever but it's all over their website all over the manual you can download and read ahead of time go to the store all they've got is a maintenance free battery which isn't which is kind of strange there's a switch on the front of the controller that lets you pick one or the other but the, the manual itself or uh, the online source says you can't use a maintenance-free battery with it, so that's another inconsistency. But anyway, about this battery, they've got what they call the big standby battery, and that's the one you're supposed to use with the Big Dog or the Big Dog Plus. Um, it is not a maintenance-free battery, um, but apparently they just renamed it. Well, not apparently. I actually called them from my cell phone while I was in Home Depot and asked their tech support and they said yeah the marketing guys decided to call it by a different name and all our documentation doesn't match it so anyway if you're buying this similar thing you're looking for the big standby battery um, interestingly enough right next to each other on the shelf are two different styles of boxes for the same battery and of course you need the chemicals I didn't talk about that before other than saying you need to do it um, Sulfuric acid, lots of companies sell this. They had a big skid full of these at Home Depot. Um, it's just a plastic bag inside of a cardboard box to give it shape and a little pull tube you pull out through a perforation and remove a little clamp, squeeze it with your fingers and let the uh, unsqueeze it to allow the fluid to flow out and squeeze it to stop the flow. It's pretty easy but you really have to have rubber gloves even though I was being careful. I managed to spill a few times. If I hadn't been wearing rubber gloves, it would have been all over my skin, which wouldn't have been all that good. I don't think it's that strong. Um, probably you could, you know, deal with it for a little while as long as you washed up right away, but uh, you don't want to get it in your eyes or all over your skin or whatever. Um, I'd actually spilled some and kneeled on it. Um, luckily I was wearing shorts so it didn't eat through my pants, but I had to go wash the skin around my knee right away to make sure I didn't get any burns from the acid. Um, anyway, so there's that aspect. And I just found this piece of paper stuck in with the manual. Um, this is talking about that uh, what they call basement watchdog connect. This is the Wi-Fi module that um, there's a couple different models of it but uh, this is the one they recommend for the Big Dog Plus and it goes into the various models of their pump products that have the USB port on them and then it'll work with their application on your smartphone. I didn't get this. I was going to. It was going to push the price over a thousand dollars because it's a couple two hundred fifty, two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars, something like that, street price. Um, and it relies on the Wi-Fi in order to alert you, but if you have a power outage, which is one of the primary reasons why this basement watchdog product be working in the first place and might have a need reason to call you uh, then if you have a power outage your Wi-Fi isn't going to work either and it you know it won't work it won't do you any good unless you have a you uninterruptible power supply on that Wi-Fi unit uh, and also your you know cable uh, cable modem or whatever you've got to to get internet to your uh, premises those things would need to be on a UPS which is another hassle and since I already have a a couple of different systems for alerting me uh, at home or if I'm elsewhere to the fact that I have a power outage or a water, a, a water level in the pump or sump issue uh, I thought this thing isn't probably going to do me any good and I didn't buy it.
Okay, here's the uh, slideshow that I promised in the earlier video section. Uh, just things that weren't covered in the purpose shot videos. Uh, this is the box that the Basement Watchdog Big Dog Plus comes in. Inside the box, as shown in this picture on the top and the front of the box, you get the plastic battery case but no battery, you get the power supply slash control unit, and you get the pump itself plus the interconnecting cables. Uh, you will still need to buy the battery, at least one. You'll need to buy the various fittings, the length of PVC pipe, uh, if there's any hoses, check valves, unions, that type of thing that need to go along with it. And the uh, kit, if you will, this box comes with one zip tie, and you really need several. Uh, you need, I think, at least one, preferably two, to hold the magnet to the standpipe above the pump. And uh, <clears throat> you're probably going to need a few more just to secure things uh, in place, uh, such as they recommend that you zip tie the pump cable to the standpipe above the pump, but they don't give you any zip ties to do that. I don't know why they don't just throw in several, but uh, there you go. Here is the uh, controller. I took it apart uh, just to see what was in it. The controller is pretty modern. It's got... Uh, uh, a small board on there for control of uh, EMI, so transient suppression, uh, filtering of uh, signals coming in and out of the controller that might cause problems. Uh, there's the big beefy power transformer, which is what allows this controller to power the pump at all times as long as AC power is available instead of relying on the batteries. There is a resistor that's apparently part of the charging circuit for the batteries. Um, and it's got a small fan that blows across the resistor. As near as I can tell, that's the function of the fan. Because it doesn't really look like the rest of it would get all that hot. Uh, and the fan, fact that the resistor is right there suggests to me that that's its primary purpose, is to cool the resistor. But there may be other aspects I'm not aware of. The circuit board has pretty much everything else on it. Looks like a very high quality double sided circuit board. There's a bank of large power diodes that are obviously part of the power supply section. And uh, here's the voltage regulators um, with their heat sinks and also with the white label on it, the microcontroller that runs everything. It's probably comparable in power to what you might find in a furnace uh, controller that you'd have uh, these days. And uh, then uh, there's a bank of power relays that actually do the switching. I'm presuming that they switch the motor current and also uh, probably activate the uh, terminals on the back that you can wire into a home security system. I haven't traced this out. That's just my best guess as to what they're good for. In my uh, earlier comments, I noted that the kit only has the power supply controller unit, the battery box, and the pump. Uh, in fact, it does have a couple of other things. Uh, it does include the dual float switch and the bracket that it goes on. And it also includes one PVC pipe fitting that allows you to um, connect one and a half inch PVC pipe to the discharge of the pump. So those two small items are also part of the kit. Earlier in the video I promised to share the basic design of my little homebrew um, power and water level monitoring system and alarm that I use to monitor my sump pump and also just the power in the house. Um, it's really quite simple but there are some parts involved and in case anybody's interested in making something like this without going into too much detail I'll just give you an overview of the circuit. So mine is line powered. I have a fuse in there and a small transformer. I use the 12.6 volt secondary transformer rated for 300 milliamps. This was a standard Radio Shack transformer back when Radio Shack was still in business. But it's a common enough value and something similar should be readily available. I used a full wave bridge rectifier. I used a probably overly large uh, 4700 microfarads. Uh, capacitor um, to filter it and that does have a reason for being that big it seems overly large but it 
is part of the time delay to reject uh, very brief power outages. Uh, I used an LM317 adjustable voltage regulator um, with the resistors as shown here, 220 ohm, 1.8K, and a 1K trim pot. I'll explain the use of that later, but it, the trim pot does adjust the voltage up and down a bit. Uh, then there's a one microfarad tantalum capacitor on the output of the uh, voltage regulator, and there's a, a backwards-facing diode to protect the voltage regulator against higher voltages on the output from the input. And this is because the wiring does leave the circuit board, and it's good practice in that case to provide this in case something gets hooked up externally that could result in uh, voltage trying to go backwards through the regulator and damaging it. So if that were to happen, it just goes through the diode instead. I have a couple of test points uh, on the circuit board for monitoring the output voltage, and that's used when adjusting the trim pot. Uh, there's two logic chips on the board. They're both uh, 4011 or 4011 CMOS logic chips. Those are just quad NAND gate or quad two input NAND gate parts. So very common CMOS part. Uh, the 12 volts, which is a nominal 12 volt generated by the the uh, eight uh, D cells, comprises a 12 volt battery um, that comes in through a pair of terminals and it's diode coupled into the positive voltage for the circuit board. Likewise, the output of the voltage regulator is also diode coupled into the same point. The reason for this is that either one can power the circuit, either the battery or the AC power supply can power the circuit, and everything else comes off this point. Uh, but you don't want to have anything coming from the batteries unnecessarily when there's AC power available. So um, this trim pot is here so you can adjust the output of the regulator a little bit higher. Um, my notes say set it to 14 volts. Um, all it really needs to be is higher than the uh, diode voltage so that whatever voltage is coming through here minus the forward voltage of this diode always results in a greater voltage here than what's coming through the 12 volts through this diode. So this diode is uh, reverse biased and does not conduct and therefore nothing comes out of the battery until the AC power dies at which point this is no longer reverse biased and then the battery uh, voltage can send current through this diode and into the rest of the circuit. Um, as part of the AC power monitoring I have a red-green bicolor LED. Uh, it only really needs to be a green LED but I wanted the LEDs to be the same color when they were green and the other LED is a bicolor LED and I found that if I just use a regular green LED next to a bicolor LED operating in green, they didn't look even remotely the same shade of green. So I just used another bicolor LED here and it's biased in a direction where it's always green when it's illuminated. The red part never gets uh, biased in the correct direction for it to light up. And then there is a uh, current limiting resistor and then it goes through a 6N139 this is just sort of a fairly vanilla um, LED optocoupler chip. And uh, basically when there is AC power coming out of the, or DC power coming out of the AC power supply, it goes through the green LED, through the current limiting resistor, and then through the LED and the optocoupler, and lights both the LED here and the LED inside the optocoupler up. That couples through and turns on the NPN transistor in the optocoupler, which makes it a short. And here you've got this RC network, um, a resistor of 47K going to V+, which is the output of the voltage regulator after the diode drop. That's this point right here. And then a 100 microfarad to ground. And uh, that's set up to give a 3 to 4 second delay. And so um, normally with power on it, this NPD is shorted out, which shorts out the capacitor, pulls this point to ground. Um, if you lose AC power, then this goes away, the NPN opens up, 
the capacitor is no longer shorted and it can start being charged from V plus through the 47K which with these component values takes three to four seconds for it to reach the necessary uh, threshold voltage. So this is the built-in time delay here but you also add to that the time delay that this capacitor here can continue to supply power to the circuit which is a few more seconds. So it's actually pushing 10 seconds before it recognizes a power failure which is a good value because a lot of shorter power, power failures may only be a few seconds long and you don't want to trip this thing just on those. You, want, you should set it up so it takes a little longer and these two time delays um, take care of that. Anyway, so when this voltage does get high enough it goes through the forward biased 1 in 914 signal diode and comes through here and goes into the logic saying that um, we have a AC power loss. Normally this would be at zero volts and therefore this diode is not forward biased and nothing happens. But when you do have a power loss it's forward biased and you're driving this here um, with a um, 12 volt or whatever signal coming from the power supply through the resistor and through the diode drop and so on. It's going to be less than 12 volts probably but pretty close to it. Anyway the other thing is of course we're trying to measure the float switch. So the float switch is down here. This is one I just bought from um, Glentronics or Basement Watchdog as a spare part. It's a reed switch magnetically operated float switch so it's um, quite reliable. It closes its contact when there's high water level. It's wired in parallel with the test switch on the circuit board and also via one or more remote panels like I showed you the photo of before the test switch on those also going to ground. So you have a float switch, an onboard test switch and one or two or possibly more offboard test switches all wired in parallel to ground. This point is normally pulled high through this resistor and then through this diode. Um, whenever any of those switches, float switch or any of the test switches are closed, they pull down through this diode and thereby pull this point down close to ground. Um, this NAND gate is wired as an inverter so when you pull this point low through the float switch or the test switch this point goes high and when that goes high it starts charging this 100 microfarad capacitor through the 47k. You'll notice those are the same component values used up here for the time delay on AC power loss and that's because I also want a three to four second delay before it reacts to a high level switch in the sump. Um, so once it charges it up to a high enough threshold then it goes through this diode to the same point that the AC power monitoring circuit went to. In either case this point goes to a logic high. Now what's this diode here doing? All it does is it discharges the capacitor quickly whenever you um, reset the float switch and whenever you don't have your finger on the test button or the float switch clears uh, this point will go to a low value near ground and it discharges the capacitor very quickly through this diode. If you didn't have the diode here it would take three to four seconds for it to discharge back through the resistor so it just gives it a quick reset. Uh, here's another a NAND gate wired as an inverter although uh, in a different configuration than this inverter they both do the same thing. You could either tie both inputs together or tie one input high and drive the other input. It does the same thing. It was mostly for convenience on the circuit board for some reason. I don't remember why. Um, there might have been a foil going between the uh, pads here on the circuit board necessitating not coupling them together it saves a jumper. Anyway it's an inverter. Um, over here is a flip-flop built out of two NAND gates and the way it works is um, both of these inputs to the flip-flop 
pin 9 and pin 5 are normally at a logic high level. Uh, when you bring this one to a logic zero, it locks the trigger on. It flips the uh, flip-flop to the on state. Um, if you bring this input to a logic zero, it resets the flip-flop. Uh, and this output is usually at logic zero, but when you've turned the flip-flop on or triggered it, it goes to a logic high. And this output is always doing just the opposite of what this output's doing. So normally it's a logic one. When it's triggered and locked in, it's a logic zero. So it's the complement of the other output. Uh, so what do we get here? Um, whenever you've got either an AC power failure or uh, a float switch or a test switch sense, this goes to a logic one, gets inverted to a logic zero. We know from before that that will trigger the flip-flop to go into its locked-in state uh, where this output goes to a logic one. Meanwhile the other output necessarily goes to a logic zero. So we go down here and uh, well let's say let's discuss the other situation first where it has not been triggered. In that case this is at a logic zero and this one's at a logic one we go through here and this is another NAND gate wires and inverter so the logic one becomes a logic zero and meanwhile this point is a logic zero inverted here to a logic one so you have current going in this direction therefore it has to go through the green LED and back to this one which is currently a logic zero thereby illuminating the green LED in a, in a normal condition. Now if we get the trigger and we flip the flip-flop to the opposite state where this is a 1 and this is a 0, now those get inverted back here. The 0 gets inverted to a 1 and the 1 gets inverted to a 0 and it drives the LEDs in the opposite direction. So now you've got current going through the red LED and the LED switches from green to red. But Notice that this inverter here isn't a single input. It also has this oscillator, which is built around two more NAND gates, two resistors, and a back-to-back -back, uh, capacitor, which probably didn't really need to be back-to-back, -back, um, but that's the way I did it. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's possible to have one side being high and the other side being low and then when it flips it's the other way around so it's a good idea to have them back to back in this situation. This gives approximately a 0.5 Hertz uh, square wave which is coupled in here so whenever we're in the triggered state where this is a logic one then the output here will go between logic zero and logic one at a 0.5 Hertz rate so it flashes um, on and off at a uh, twice a second uh, rate, essentially. Or a correction on this, it's 0.5 hertz, which meaning it's going to be one second in each state approximately. So it makes one alteration every two seconds instead of every half second, which would have been what I started to say before. Anyway, it gives you the flashing effect of the red LED. And the, the calculated rate, rates weren't exact. The point is to get something that flashes on and off at a fairly quick rate, but still slow enough that you can easily see it flashing. So what else is going on here? Um, <clears throat> eventually you need to reset the flip-flop, and you've got the reset switch on the circuit board and one or more parallel connected reset switches on the various remote panels they're all wired between this point and ground. So once again it's normally pulled high but when you activate any of the reset switches it pulls it low and as we know pulling this low resets the flip-flop to its normal state. So again pretty simple. Um, the final thing to talk about here is when you have triggered it this goes to a logic zero and that goes up here through a resistor to a PNP transistor 
it's a high side switch in this case because it's connected directly on its emitter to the um, V plus power supply and as we know when a PNP is connected in this way a low signal turns it on and since we have a low signal here coming out of the flip-flop that turns it on and it conducts from the power supply into these remote panels. In the remote panel is a LED and the sun alert or other loud buzzer wired in parallel. You have to make sure that the buzzer can operate at 12 volts or nearby uh, to that voltage for proper operation. Now this LED here, even though it's not shown in the schematic, is got a current limiting resistor connected in it. So you should have a, a resistor shown in this point here. Or, I think this schematic was originally drawn when I was going to use an off-the-shelf, um, <clears throat> one of the red Radio Shack panel LEDs that has a built-in or an integral current limiting resistor and the schematic was drawn accordingly and then the, I ended up just using a regular red LED and had to stick a, um, a limiting resistor inside the circuit right there to uh, accommodate that. I set this up so you can use a four conductor phone cable or telephone cable to connect between the main circuit board and one or more of these remotes. Really there's no practical limitation on how many you can have in parallel as long as you don't exceed the capacity of the power supply. <clears throat> There's no other big loads on this and it's good for upwards of 300 milliamps. I don't know exactly what the sun alerts take. It's not that much current so you could have several of these in parallel. The LED takes virtually nothing. Um, anyway, so um, the I use the red wire for the positive supply to the remote panels. I use the black wire to come back to ground and then I have the yellow wire and the green wire for the test and reset switches which also go to ground so the whole thing can be done with four wires and that's pretty convenient for running it around the house and you don't have to put it in conduit or anything it's <clears throat> perfectly safe if you cut it nothing bad's going to happen if a mouse chews through it, nothing bad's going to happen. It's no worse than having something happen to a telephone wire. So I think I've pretty well covered uh, the circuit there. Um, I think that's about it. So hopefully you found this all useful.